God is within us and knows everything. God is without us and sees everything. God is beyond us and is everything. There is only one reality. The entire time process is imaginary. The billions of years that have passed and the billions of years that are to pass do not have the value of a second. J. Baba. Our special guest speaker for this year's Southeast Gathering is Noshawan Anzar, who is well known. Well known in the Baba community as the editor and publisher of Glow International Magazine. In addition to the Glow Magazine, Noshawan has also written or compiled several books about Baba. He also created beloved archives to preserve precious artifacts of the God Man's advent. Noshawan grew up in a Baba family that did significant work for Baba during the new life. And his talk tonight is entitled Living the New Life. Noshawan, in fact, was there and remembers seeing Baba in the new life. We are going to learn, hear stories he rarely tells. So please join me in welcoming our very special guest, Noshirwan Anzar. Jai Baba. Jai Meher Baba to all my fellow new life travelers. Sometime back, the head of a Baba group embraced me and said, could you come to our group before you die and tell us how you came to Mayor Baba? As it turns out, I never came to Mayor Baba. Mayor Baba came to me. I was two months old and during a visit to my family house in Dehradun, which is in the foothills of the Himalayas, about 150 miles from New Delhi, beloved Baba came with four of his disciples for lunch of dal and rice. He picked me up in his arms and nestled me on his lap. He carried me from room to room to the utter delight of my parents. As one Baba lover wag said, he was not carrying you he was cooking you. <laughs> 20 years later, I published a collection of poems titled In Lap of Love, for which he gave a special message as the frontispiece. I believe my new life journey started uh, from then onwards, and it continues to this very day. I would like to thank Jim Watson and the Board of Southeast Gathering for inviting me to share my spiritual journey, which has been a long one, but not an arduous one, because it was with Meher Baba. Some of you may have read details of Meher Baba's new life phase in books and narration of the Mandli who accompanied him. Today you will hear stories and see photographs of my, my life with Meher Baba that you may not have heard and seen. But they are entirely from my perspective, for I'm, I was fortunate to participate in the Derudun segment of the new life. In my 20 plus years of intimacy with beloved Baba, till he dropped his physical form in uh, 1969. Uh, he always gave me instructions, orders, and directives in numbers. I would get a letter from Erich, Baba wants you to follow these five instructions that Baba has given. Baba wants you to do the following with the glow. Uh, 
and so on and so forth. So it was always in numbers. So for this gathering, I have created eight affirmations uh, that open eight doors to pathways that lead to the new life journey. There are eight doors to awakening the spiritual pathways of the soul. The first door is the door of conviction. Now all these eight doors I have drawn from the Song of the New Life, which contains the core and the elements of the new life, as well as the entire new life phase. So there are eight doors to awakening the spiritual pathways of the soul. To enter each of these doors, the human spirit needs to sharpen its intuitive capacity, muster the power of intention. And even though all action is predestined, add consciously without worry or fear our divine journey. Our spiritual quest is to find these doors and enter through them into a sanctuary that is mysterious, unknown, but unimaginably beautiful. How do we know it? We know it because it is our sanctuary your sanctuary, the sanctuary of the soul. I speak from experience, an experience of the awakening of the heart by Uttar Mehr Baba. I now choose to share this experience with all of you. I have walked through these doors, these doors of divinity. And I share its beauty and majesty, the way I experienced it. So as I mentioned, the first door is the door of conviction. In 1965, I was a young man of 19. Uh, I had been through a very, very rough phase in my life that I will share later. Uh, it was uh, a period of renunciation that I had contemplated, and I followed certain instructions from Mayor Baba. That story I will narrate a lot later in context. But in order for me to divert my attention from the spiritual agony that I was going through, I decided to attend the Third World Religions Conference, of which I was the youngest delegate. I was 19. Of course, I had to take Baba's permission. And uh, I sent in my application of 100 rupees. And they came back and asked me. They had no idea that I was a teenager. Because everybody, the Pope's emissary, the Shankracharya, People from all religious faiths, religions, communities, sects were coming for the Third World Religions Conference. So they asked me my subject. What would be my subject? And they gave me a choice of either speaking in the section on faith or section on, um, on uh, world peace. Or they would had different, different platforms. So I chose a subject. And the subject was the supervening powers of faith in the evolution of world peace, which meant practically nothing. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to uh, kind of give them the feeling that I was an older person. <laughs> so when I went there, uh, we were all guests of the, uh, there was in the Rashtrapati Bhavan, which is the presidential 
home, there is um, uh, there was a Baba lover who had he was the social secretary of the president of India. And his name was Vasudev Kane, and he had a lovely bungalow there. So I went and stayed there, and I didn't know that there were five other Baba lovers who were also participants at the Third World Religions Conference. So we, but. I was so busy mugging up my 45 minute speech that I had no time to socialize with anybody. I was just trying to remember my speech. It was, I hadn't given a, a speech to 20 people and here I was going to address hundreds and thousands. But that morning, the day of the conference, I get a cable from Mayor Baba. I'm with you at the Third World Religions Conference. And I said to myself, nothing can go wrong. <laughs> so I was, I landed up at the conference and the conference was um, uh, sponsored by Muni Sushil Kumar, uh, uh, the head of the Jain sect, the, the, the Swetambar sect, there are two sects of the Jains. They, one of them, they wear masks, all of them wear masks. The women don't wear clothes, they just wrap a sari around them, and they are bold, the women, and they walk bare feet from place to place and so forth. So there were these, uh, so the, and the men don't wear any clothes, they're naked. So the head of the Swetambar was sitting there, sitting naked on the stage, and then the <laughs> And then the man with the, the, the ma mask was sitting, he was the head of the president of the, of the conference. And, um, uh, and Sant Kirpal Singh, who some of you may have heard that name, was uh, the vice president of the conference. But the secretary was a man called Baron Frary von Blomberg. He was a German. Uh, who was a disciple of Sant Kirpal Singh, but was very interested in Mayor Baba. So when I met him and introduced me, he took me under his wing and went and introduced me to everybody and so forth. And he said, he's the youngest delegate at this conference. We are so proud that he's come and he's representing Mayor Baba and so forth. <coughs> anyway, my turn came to speak. And this vast sea of people in front of me. So, I uh, started my speech by talking about world. They had put me in the uh, platform of, for world peace. So, I started talk, telling them about Zarathustra's message on world peace and, and uh, Ram's message on world peace, Krishna's message on world peace, uh, Buddha's message on world peace. Muhammad's message on world peace. And now we have in our midst the king of peace, Avtar Meher Baba. The moment I uttered Baba's name, two men physically jumped me and asked me to sit down, sit down. And they were pulling my leg. And I got so flustered that I completely forgot my speech. And uh, in a little demagogic fashion, I said, but Baba had sent me that cable. So I went to the mic and I said, I have uttered the name of Avtar Meher Baba. If you want me to continue speaking, I will. Otherwise, I will sit down. And there was a roar. We want Meher Baba. We want Meher Baba. <laughs> It just seemed as if Baba had planted these people there. <laughs> so uh, I continued, but I had forgotten my speech. And I said, I talked about Baba on world peace, which I had prepared before that. And that was the end of it. And that evening, I went to a Zoroastrian conference with the head of the Zoroastrians, the worldwide Zoroastrian, because they were all, they were all there. They were all heads of all. Uh, religions were there. So I went to this conference and the moment I mentioned, so my uh, aunt 
was the wife of the president of the Zoroastrian Association of New Delhi. So she'd invited me and she said, you know, say a few words if you can. And so the man invited me to say a few words after the head priest had given his talk. So I, so she said, so he said, uh, we have a young boy, a young man from Dehradun who's going to give his impressions of the conference. So I started by saying, I was at the conference to speak on Autar Meher Baba. And like a jack in the box, the priest jumped up and said, I have never been so insulted in my life. <laughs> and he staged a walkout. And uh, everybody surrounded me and said, um, uh, when is Baba going to uh, give darshan and when can we see him? And there was a trip in the Zoroastrian community, um, there were a lot of closet Baba lovers. <laughs> so uh, they all wanted to know about Baba. <clears throat> so then I wrote to Baba, but Baba was not satisfied with my long letter. He wanted me to come over. So I was there, uh, now I'm not going into detail with this little segment, which was on May 4th, 1965, but I went uh, to Guru Prasad and I sat in Baba's presence. And uh, I was at his feet, so it was kind of my show. And I looked around and the woman, Mandali was sitting against the wall and Erich was standing next to Baba. So Erich turns to me and says, Baba wants to know every small detail about your participation in the Third World Religions Conference. And also what happened with the Zoroastrians. <laughs> so, uh, so I started narrating and uh, I narrated and Baba always had this habit of uh, interrupting you. He would, uh, he, first of all, when I was narrating, and especially about the Zoroastrians, I've never seen him laugh so heartedly. He went red in the face. <laughs> because, uh, you know, the Zoroastrian community had worked intensely against Meher Baba to denigrate him. And we'll talk about that at another time as well. But, uh, so he would... He would go laugh like this with me. His entire body would shake with laughter. So uh, then uh, Irish had told me, don't ask any questions of Baba. This is not the time for questions. So uh, I said, and my head was seething with questions. So I narrated. So Baba always in interrupted. He says, do you love me? He would say, yes, Baba. So then he, continue, I would keep quiet. And then he continue, continue. So I would continue. And then uh, he would go to some, somebody else, do you love me? Uh, yes, Baba. And I would keep quiet, continue, continue. <laughs> so this kept on happening. And then uh, as I was getting to the end, he says, do you accept me as God in human form? And I said, absolutely, Baba. And at that moment, he clapped. And out walked Gohar with holding something in her hand. And uh, Baba said at that moment, I want you to tell the world that I'm God in human form. It was a mandate that he had never, he has never ever given to anybody in his entire ministry. I was the only one to have been given this mandate. So he gave me this mandate. At that moment, I didn't think very much. And then Gohar came with this box in her hand. And from that box, Baba took out this medallion and gave it to me to seal what he had just said with Baba's face on one side and mastery and servitude with all the religions represented on the other side. So that's what he gave me to seal the mandate. 
This is what masters do when they give you a mask mandate. They give you something, um, a shawl or a blanket or something. I treated this as a gift from the Lord to carry out the mandate. And from that point onwards, I have solemnly kept that mandate. So, but as I said that my head was seething with questions, and um, so as I was narrating, I said, uh, Baba, then the, they are, uh, people asked me a lot of questions, both at the conference as well as at the Zoroastrian meeting. And uh, I was, by your grace, able to answer all the questions except one. And immediately Baba said, <laughs> what was that question? So I said, Baba, they wanted to know how can Mayor Baba say that he's God in human form? And, you know, it was like Baba's expression was, oh, what a simple question. And, but then he became very serious. And when he was serious, you could feel palpably his seriousness. He said, you, Nosharwan, are God in human form. Erich Yer is God in human form. Francis is God in human form. But each one of you are unconscious of your divinity. I am conscious of my divinity, and consequently, I can uh, say that I am God in human form. But how do I make each one of you conscious of your divinity? I give you the gift of conviction. This is what he said. And the reason why each one of you are here is because he has given you the gift of conviction. Otherwise, you would be in somewhere in your hometown. <laughs> the greatest power and gift humanity possesses is the freedom to express our deepest conviction. All our successes and accomplishments emerge from our ability to exercise our conviction or strong belief. While conviction is a gift from God, in the belief that we are divine. Oftentimes, our greatest failures and mistakes can come from misplaced conviction. Very often, our negative attitudes are expressions of imagined failure. In essence, our concern and our worry for something that might never happen. Baba said, what is worry? Worry is something that may or may not happen. That is worry. Prophesies are being success, unsuccessful. If we can make a leap from our mundane existence, focusing on our faults and shortcomings to conscious divinity with our potential for success and innate goodness, we will be on the constant path to victory. When Mayor Baba asked me to share his message of love, truth, and spiritual unity in 1965, I came back to Dehradun and gathered the Mayor Baba Dehradun group and asked them, uh, how should I fulfill, how should I begin fulfilling my mandate? And they immediately said that, look, uh, Baba was here uh, in 1953. We'd like to do a commemorative magazine uh, for that occasion. So, I, and I was already a journalist and good at doing magazines. So I said, that's a brilliant idea. But nobody had any money. So my mother said she would donate 200 rupees, which would be $2.41 <laughs> at that time. And another Bible lover said 
he would donate 200 rupees. So for that sum of money, I launched Glow International. <laughs> I was 20 years old at that time. Mehr Baba gave me the conviction to accomplish what he felt I could do with it, within the ambit of my capabilities and opened a door to me, a door for me to enter. Mehr Baba lifted the curtain and gave me the gift of conviction in his divinity. Once you have the deep, deep conviction that with the help of your beloved master, you can face all obstacles, nothing can stop you. No one can stop you. And that is because you have his grace to spur you on. What does conviction mean? We've talked about conviction, but what does it mean? It simply means to fulfill your spiritual destiny if you continue to follow the path of purity, sincerity, and faith in your ability to accomplish, and above all, complete faith in Meher Baba. I will, and I can. Oftentimes on this pathway, you will be faced with insurmountable difficulties. I've heard, I've been talking to several people uh, uh, these past two days, and several people have said to me, we have had to face insurmountable difficulties. And I'm addressing this to them. They are insurmountable to you but they are not insurmountable to the beloved you have come to love and trust. Remember, one door might be slammed on your face, but very quickly another door opens up. A door leading you to success, triumph and victory. Today we say, Jai Baba, Jai Mehr Baba, which simply means victory to Mehr Baba. But when you have deep conviction in Mehr Baba's divinity, you can with divine honesty say, Jai Mehr Baba, that signifies your victory as well. In 1962, I was at the East-West gathering. I was sitting in the, the there were close to 10,000 people, and I'm not going to narrate the whole story of my visit in 62, but each one, each one was allocated the region that they came from, and I was sitting in Uttar Pradesh, where I came from. And there were Andhra, and there was Tamil Nadu, and different, different states were represented. And everybody had to sit in their respective states. So, uh, Harry Kenmore, thundered the Parvardhagar prayer, and you must have heard that. And, uh, you know, your hair stands on edge when he recited the Master's Prayer. At that moment, my mind was going crazy. Will Baba, I had met, the last time I had met Baba was in 19, uh, was in Dehradun. Will Baba remember me? Would he know that I'm here? Would he? Hardly did this thought cross my mind when Erich on the mic at the stage says, Nosharan, Baba wants you on the stage. So always remember what you wish for. <laughs> it can happen. So I cheerfully go on to the stage. I and embrace Baba, kiss him on both the cheeks, bow down to him, and I sit down at his feet. Now, when you come in Baba's presence, nothing, nobody, nothing else matters. All you do is you stare at him. You look at him. My mother was standing a distance. She was, uh, the different volunteers, she was standing there. For all the time that Baba gave darshan, she stood there staring at him, just staring at him. 
And I was sitting and staring at him and looking at the interaction that he had with different people. So hundreds of people would come down, bow down to him. Um, people would do crazy things. One guy came and broke a bottle of Chanel uh, perfume at his feet, not, <laughs> not, not realizing that it would hurt him. And you know, they do all. They put, bring garlands, they bring fruits, they bring sweets, and all kinds of things. And the mandli had to keep on picking them and putting them away. They they wouldn't think about that. They would choke Baba with garlands. They would put garlands on his neck, and you know. so I was looking at him, staring at him. And as he he would be, sometimes he would talk to Eraj. Sometimes he would talk to Elizabeth Patterson, who was sitting at his feet. Uh, and there were others who were sitting, and he would turn and say something to them. And suddenly, from the audience, somebody would say, of 10,000 people, somebody would say, Avtar Meher Baba ki jay! Suddenly, out of the blue. And his hand would go to his chest. I thought that I was the only one who saw that. And suddenly, uh, he would continue, the Darshan line would continue, and somebody would say, Jay Meher Baba! And his hand would go to his chest. That was the first lesson I learned of what his name means. Each time somebody shouted or said, Jai Mehr Baba or Tar Mehr Baba Ki Jai, his hand went to his chest, to his heart. And I knew that his name meant everything. And you're all here today because you have that conviction. You have been awakened to Meher Baba's new life, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so what have you got now? We are now entering door number two. I decided to make it simplify by putting pictures of doors so now you enter door number two called the new life consciousness. Because as you journey and walk with him, you develop the new life consciousness. Why did Mer Baba give the name new life to his phase of intimate companionship on a spiritual journey? What is the new life? What is the new life? When we are awakened with the ability to be conscious of our divinity without being judgmental of our inner selves, our belief systems, our attitude, our intent, we will have taken the first step onto the new life. This new life consciousness, even though we are not aware of it, comes from the conviction of being conscious of God's attribute within each one of us. Attributes of love. You have that. Attributes of generosity, of charity, and forgiveness. You have all these attributes within you. So what that, does that make you? God. Because those are the attributes of God. As human beings, we only look at our faults, our mistakes, our shortcomings, completely forgetting that we are made in the image of God. Even if our life situation looks impossible, even if we feel that we are beyond redemption, we need to tap into the deep reservoir of God's gift of conviction. It is only when we bring this gift of conviction from the depths of self-doubt to the surface of our consciousness can we feel the impact of God's power of conviction. It is this conviction that can turn dross into gold, turn negative forces to positive results, and that is the gift that the avatar gives to each one of us. Once at the 1954 Western Men's Gathering in Mehrabad, Baba asked those gathered to close their eyes and picture his form in their mind's eye. 
He then asked Francis how his experience was. Francis said, it comes and goes. Baba replied, that's because you come and go. <laughs> Baba had told us that he gives us inner guidance. He's not in the form any longer. Well, what do we have today? What do each one of you have? His inner guidance. And his inner guidance will always remain with us. We often feel that inner guidance is blocked and we don't feel his presence. That is because we are in the way. Baba's light and presence are always there. But our negative emotions get in the way. Our negative sanskars are like dark clouds, concealing his beauty, his brilliance, his magnanimity. The moment we surrender, let go of these negatives and place them at his feet, we begin the journey of seeing him as he really is. We now enter the third door, the door of awakening. Being awakened to a spiritual life of love for God and love for our fellow beings and a feeling of empathy for those less fortunate helps us mature to a life of tolerance, a life of selflessness. Those who become God conscious are said to be awake. Once you're awake, be aware that your life is special, precious, and that you are destined to awaken others. Don't take that awakening for granted. In 1960, the president of the Pune Center, who had dedicated his life in the service of the Lord, after seeing a weeping mother trying to save the life of a child, wrote to Baba, asking him, in inverted commas, to take my life but save the child. He wrote to Baba, Baba, take my life, but please save the child. I can't see that suffering of the mother. Baba wrote to him that he was upset and shocked by his letter. And this is the letter that Erich wrote under Baba's direction. Baba wants to know from you how you could have dreamed of asking him to take away your life. After your dedication, you cannot ever have a right over your own life. So Baba adds that perhaps you have not dedicated your life as it should be dedicated to him. Your life has been dedicated to Baba's cause, and as such, it has become priceless and precious. Therefore, you cannot afford to squander your life, which is no longer yours. Nor can you lay it down for the happiness or joy of others, since it now belongs to Baba. During the passage of years, we go through a multitude of experiences, joy and suffering, pain and pleasure, agony and ecstasy. Once you are awakened to God's love, conscious of your divinity, understand that it is all a passing phase, a dream, a product of our overactive mind. Simply look at your mind the way a watch repairer opens a broken watch and examines it. He separates it piece by piece and examines it. Recently, an old watch of mine was damaged. I went from one mechanic to another and was told that the company that manufactured the watch did not make parts for the watch. I finally came across a mechanic who said that he could create a part for the watch and make it work, which he did. Our mind is like a watch. It can go on ticking for a long time, but if a part is to be replaced, it must be consciously crafted. Our mind is constantly shifting, constantly changing, 
always in a state of motion. The role of the avatar is to awaken us, and when Mir Baba awakens you, he fills your heart with his love. As per God's will and your spiritual preparedness, you will receive God's grace in his time, not in your time. But you will experience his grace continually. Our life is divided into two lives. The old life and the new life. Now this is something that you all can relate. The old life and the new life. Your old life was filled with all kinds of experiences that you were destined to go through. But you don't want to be associated with them anymore. You don't even want to think about those not-so-great experiences. So now we enter the fourth door. As you walk with Meher Baba as his companion. So when the avatar awakens you, he makes you his companion. And walks with you on a spiritual journey taking you with him to where you are sanskarically destined to go. When he takes you into his fold, he asks you to surrender. He tells us that while it is difficult to surrender to the will of God, true surrender helps us accept God's will with equanimity, even in the face of helplessness and hopelessness. On a spiritual level and suffering on a physical level. And to achieve that level of surrender, he asks us to obey him. Now all these elements I have, you will hear as you go along on your journey on the new life. Complete surrender gives us inner strength and a conviction that we will always be in God's presence. Those who have suffered intensely through the process of a life-threatening disease or the loss of a dear one or material loss can never forget the deep pain. It is a pain that is personal and often cannot be shared or verbalized. All of you have gone through that pain and that suffering that you cannot even share with others. You cannot even verbalize. You cannot talk about it. It's so painful. The only healing that all those, all of you can experience is by appreciating each day of your own life. They see each day as a gift from God and God's love for them. It is then that they learn the lessons of surrender. It is then that they understand that there is indeed a purpose in God's plan for each one of us. All of us, when we reach maturity, look for life options. Someone wants to become a scientist or a writer or a politician or a poet or whatever. But life does not unfurl the way we want it or we plan it. That is because our plans are limited. For those of us who believe in predestination, know that God has already planned our life for us, already mapped the trajectory of our life. When we don't see our plans grow the way we determine them, we become bitter, sad, losing our trust and faith in God. And then, as T.S. Eliot said once, a timeless moment comes in our lives when we realize that the life that God determines for us was the one that was most crafted for us. It is therefore very important for each one of us to stay connected to God by thinking of him, repeating his name, and meditating on his image. My father, Keki Nalawala, worked for the Singer Sewing Machine Company. One day, he learned that he had lost his job at the Singer Sewing Machine Company. He had started with the company when he was 18, 
and then he had a shop in Dehradun. And then Singer Sewing Machine Company decided that they were going to get out of India. So they went to the dealers and said, either buy up the inventory or you don't have a job. And my father was not the entrepreneurial type and he was devastated. And he wrote a very sad and morose letter to Baba, explaining his predicament. I have a wife who's not keeping good health. I have two children. And Baba, what should I do? I'm growing old. He was in his 40s. I'm growing old. <laughs> and uh, what, do, what do I do now, Baba? And so forth. So Baba always, always sent a cable first. He sent a cable to my father and don't worry, all will be well. God is Malik, God is supreme. Letter follows. Now these are Mer Baba's words. Listen to them very carefully. He followed up with a letter. Have no fear at all. God is almighty. He's the Lord. And he will make you dance according to his wish. You must start your new business without a second thought or any worry. Why don't you become the boss since my nazar is on you? Now the word boss is in inverted commas and there's a story behind this. When Baba was in Dehradun, uh, my father used to go every morning at 6.30 to be with Baba in the mandli. So, uh, and then he was working for the singer company. So he would tell Baidul, one of Baba's disciples, and egg him on and nudge him, tell Baba to make me a boss at the singer sewing machine company. <laughs> so he would keep on telling him. So Baidul one day told Baba, Baba, why don't you make him the boss? He couldn't pronounce the word boss. So, so everybody would laugh, Baba would laugh, but never react. So what are you afraid of? Have hope, have courage, be courageous, and carry out your work successfully. Where there is honesty and purity of heart, there is God. Don't give up his company. Why are you worried about old age now? <laughs> you have to grow young now. Do not be afraid. The plan you have outlined should be put into practice and get ready to become the boss. <laughs> so my father was encouraged and inspired. He bought up his inventory and set up a, bought the same, rented the same shop and became a successful businessman and an entrepreneur and then retired and then passed away a few years later. So as we become adults, we move away from our families. And you're very, all of you are very conscious of that. You're not living with your fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers. You're all moved away from your families, as I have, as each one of you have. And you've created new families. Very often, this new family is the Baba family. Family of Baba lovers. And it is with this family that we walk with beloved Baba following the new life. And when we read of those early days, we learn to live in harmony with people whom Baba has chosen as his companions and are now our companions as well. Those Westerners who came to live with Baba in the Nasik Ashram in the 30s were often roomed together, resulting in personality clashes. He said, see, she said, um, she put her clothes in my bed and she put her stuff in my cupboard and so on and so forth. What brought them together was love and obedience to their master. They had to develop the ability to accept others as they are and learn the art of forgiveness. That was an essential lesson of the new life. One of 
Kitty Davis' favorite expressions was jane do. She would always tell people jane do, which means let go, let go. Baba would often say that I would rather sh close down this ashram than you, all of you, bickering about each other. So now we enter door number five of unquestioned obedience. When one comes in contact with a spiritual being like Meher Baba, whether one has met him when he was in his physical body or connected with him after he dropped his body. Obedience means conviction in the power of his words and the power of his teachings towards a joyous and meaningful life. I would presume that none of you have met Baba in the physical form. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Mayor Baba once said that Ten Commandments, he had sent his, the women monthly to go and see Ten Commandments. And they said, oh, what a wonderful film was it was. And Baba said that Mayor Baba once said the Ten Commandments were not carved on tablets. The commandments have been given by the avatars of the past, but mankind has ignored them. Indeed, we spend all our lives trying to skirt these commandments. We tried to find out ways, how can I speak the untruth which sounds like the truth? How can I lie uh, when I can uh, get away with it? And so on and so forth. So often people ask me this question. You were able to spend time with Mer Baba, ask him questions, get answers, and be guided by him. Yes, that is true. I was fortunate to be guided by him every step of the way till he dropped his body. But that does not mean that those who have not met Mer Baba in his physical form are less fortunate. For me, that guidance, that helping and healing hands have not stopped. In fact, I feel his guidance and his helping hand a lot more. Today, he's not encumbered by the weight of his physical form. He is everywhere. He's in everyone. And he is for everyone. If you have conviction in Mer Baba's divinity, Incredible things can happen to you. He has already sown the seed of love in your hearts. As you go through life, you will see amazing things happen to you in your job, in your relationships, and in your interaction with the world. The gift of conviction that he has given you will keep giving. The seed of love that he has sown in your heart will continue to blossom each day. It is at that time that you need to fall on your knees in gratitude and pray to God. Now prayer is not a litany of wants and desires, nor is it an accumulation of rites, rituals and ceremonies. It is a simple expression of gratitude to the one who gives without asking in return. Whether you pray at your personal altar or someone else prays for you or groups of people gather to pray collectively, it is the highest form of devotion to God. It will not only help you on a personal level, but a simple prayer will help heal the wounds of the world. Now let me illustrate this with a short story. I'm reminded of a story of Esfandiar Vesali. Some of you have met him. Some of you have known him. He stayed in India, for, uh, in America for quite some time and gave talks at several different places. I believe he came also for the Southeast Gathering. Yeah. So the story is that as I walked with Esfandiar Vesali with him 
in his orchard of cherry trees in Tehran. During my visit to Iran in 1976, he asked me if I wanted to take a walk through his cherry orchard. And I, we just the two of us walked. During the years apart from Baba, Asfandiya wrote to Baba about his desire to return to India. But several times the Mandli wrote back saying that Baba was in seclusion and he couldn't come. Finally, Baidul wrote in 1963 and told him he could come to India. But Asfandiya replied that he had no money to travel. So Baba told him to speak to the trees in his cherry orchard and tell each tree one by one of his desire to go to India and take Baba's darshan. Usually the blossoms would freeze each year, ruining the fruit. But that year, they gave an ample crop of cherries, enabling him to make the pilgrimage. As soon as he knew that the fruit would be abundant, he borrowed the money for the trip. Now this is ample evidence of one human being's complete faith in Baba when you beseech him with all your heart. And please always remember, when you beseech him with all your heart, he will answer, not at your time, but at his time. So now we enter the door of selfless service. The most tangible gift that God gives each one of us is the ability to serve, share, and give. Nothing compares to the ability to serve others. Service simply means the capacity and capability of sharing our deep belief system, our faith in God, and tapping into the deep reservoir of our innate feelings to serve and serve selflessly. The motto of Mayor Baba's ministry was mastery in servitude. And all his life, Mayor Baba demonstrated the purest elements of service. Feeding the poor, bathing lepers, cleansing and working with the guarding intoxicated souls and transforming the lives of seekers everywhere. He was a living example of selfless service even when his body was completely broken. In 1962, as I mentioned, I was at the East West gathering, sitting at his feet. And there were others sitting on the other side. And Baba turns to Erich and he says, call that woman. So Erich goes to that woman and says, Baba wants you. And she turns her face. Her name was Mona Sakre. She was the wife of Wing Commander Sakre, who used to sit in Jawaharlal Nehru's war cabinet, a powerful Air Force chief. So she uh, turns her face and doesn't want to come to Baba. Now, Mona Sakre was in and out of the hospitals and doctors, and she was in very bad health all her life. And she always felt that Baba was not doing enough for her. That she was always suffering and suffering. So he comes back to Baba and Baba says, go to her and again call her. I saw this with my own eyes, this whole scenario. Call her, call her again, man. She looked in the face. Third time. You remember, Baba always did things in threes. So call her again. Finally, she comes. And she comes to Baba and bursts out crying. And Baba says, Mona, I know, I know, I know how much you suffer. 
takes out his handkerchief and gives it to her to dab her tears. He dabs her tears. And he says, Mona, do you know how much I suffer? You don't. And you never will. But I give my special ones an infinitesimally small portion of that suffering. Will you not share in my suffering? And she thanked Baba profusely and went back to her seat. I was very deeply touched by this interaction. He served people without judging them because he knew the real worth of each individual. Each one of you is unique in God's eyes. Each one of you is special, born to serve God's purpose. Disregard those who judge you or condemn you. You are the perfect drop souls on your journey to the oversoul. I promise you. When Mir Baba sent the divine call in your heart, and you can hark back to the time in the 60s, and many of you hearkened that call in the 60s, when he sent the silent call in your heart to awaken you, you became restless. A divine discontent arose in your heart, and you yearned to search for more. What is this? What is this call for a spiritual life coming into my heart when I have messed it up so badly? And you're searching for more and more and there must be something more. Mir Baba calls this initial search the stone stage of discipleship. It can take several lifetimes of preparation. You become a spiritual seeker and start a desperate search for answers. Baba calls this the worm stage of discipleship. <laughs> you figure that you will get all your answers from books and religious literature. Before long, you realize that intellectual knowledge is not enough and you need a guide on your path. Your search brings you in contact with many masters, including some false ones. However, your real master is waiting in the wings, protecting you from falling into a spiritual abyss. The moment you are ready, the master appears. While we call it as coming to Meher Baba, the reality is that Meher Baba comes to you when you are ready. Baba calls this the dog stage when he trains you to obey him and sit at his feet awaiting his commands. So now we come to door number seven. We enter door number seven the door of divine love. The highest form of existence in this lifetime is the capacity of loving others without expectation of reciprocation. Human beings have pools of love within them. Some of you can freely express feelings of love. Others are restrained in their expression. But everyone can express love for God. The moment love is awakened, the heart is satiated and the soul discovers its spiritual purpose. That is when true conviction is born within us. Mary Baba's universal message embodied the elements of divine love. His entire ministry was based on the understanding that love was the engine that took God-conscious souls from this shore to that shore. And I'll tell you something about, this is not my expression, this shore to that shore. One day, I used to work for the Times of India. And one day I attended, I was a speaker, as well as I, was, uh, I went to the Transpersonal Psychology Conference in Bombay. And the Times of India found out that I was 
a representative there, and they asked me if I would do double duty and cover a press conference by a Swami they didn't know who he was. His name was Swami Muktananda. Many of you may have heard that name. Okay. So I had, a, I had two encounters with him. One was a strange one, which we won't go into it now. You can ask me privately. So all the journalists were there, and there was Stanislav Grof, and I crossed swords with him because he talked about LSD for recreational purposes. And I told him that obviously he'd never read Meher Baba's message about LSD and so forth. And we talked. You've heard of Stanislav Grof. He was, yeah. So then after that, all the journalists were supposed to walk past Muktananda at the end of the press conference, bow down, do namaste to him, and walk on. And, you know, do namaste. He did not speak English. He only spoke Hindi. But he had a very smart secretary. Her name was Malti, who later on became Guru Mai, uh, one of the spiritual masters. So I saw... I decided that I would bypass her, which she was not happy about, because I spoke Hindi. So I bypassed her and went to Swami Muktananda directly. And I said, uh, I'm a follower of Meher Baba. And I did this. And he said, oh, Meher Baba, the ocean of love. And then he said something, he added, Mayor Baba can take you from this shore to that shore. And that's stuck in my memory. And that's how I have used it over here. That he can take you from this shore to that shore. From unconscious divinity to conscious divinity. It is then that the gift of conviction gradually but surely becomes the overwhelming gift of divine love, then all separateness ends and we are not we but one. And I'm going to uh, end this door with this quote of mine, which all of you know by heart probably, but this quote of Baba's encapsulates all of Mayor Baba's teachings to penetrate into the essence of all being and significance and to release the fragrance of that inner attainment for the guidance and benefit of others by expressing in the world of forms truth, love, beauty, and purity. And purity. This is the sole game which has any intrinsic and absolute worth. All other happenings, incidents, and attainments can in themselves have no lasting importance. And now we enter the last door. Refuge in him. As you see him standing with the door open. So Mayor Baba said, I am the way and the goal. While his job is to keep the fire of love glowing in our hearts, our job is to keep him as our constant companion and take refuge in him. One day I was in uh, Merazad. I used to live there for a period of time. And uh, Erich would go in to the Mandli Hall, close the door, pray to Baba, say the Master's Prayer and so forth. So one day he came out and I asked him. I could ask him anything and get an answer, anything. He never turned me away. So I said... I know you say the Master's Prayer and the Repentance Prayer, but is there anything that you say to him uh, asking him something? Do you ask him for anything? So he said, yes. I say, Beloved Baba, please always keep me in your presence. And I have from that point on was always said that every night. Because if you're always in his presence, what wrong can you do? Nothing. Because you wouldn't do anything if you were in his presence. That is wrong. That is incorrect. That does not suit your conscience. So Mayor Baba has told humanity time and time again that in this event he has come not to teach but to awaken. 
once he has awakened us and declared us to be his companions, we are sharing his new life consciousness. And the next step is for us to hold on to his dhaman with both hands till we reach the destination of attaining oneness with him and becoming God realized. But how can we hold on to his dhaman? Is there a piece of cloth? Is there a sadra that you can hold on to? Is there a, a kafni that you can hold on to? The hem of his robe? He gives us the answer. Take refuge solely in me. Complete reliance on him is holding on to his dhaman. It is taking refuge in Meher Baba, the avatar who the master's prayer addresses as the preserver and protector of all. Once we discover the first door, the door of conviction, once we step over the threshold, we are pulled into the vortex of a spiritual life that can only be termed as divine. We are living a divine life of love and togetherness. Over a period of our seemingly long life, we walk alongside seekers on the path, living a life of divine desperateness, yearning, crying, longing for a spark, totally unaware of their spiritual potential, their ability to reach the acme of self-awareness. Who are these people? We are. We are one of them. The revelation of these eight doors is all about the innate need to rise above the mundane and live a life of fulfillment, a life of freedom from the shackles of the past and onwards to the path of victory. Mir Baba opened these eight doors for me. If you enter even one of these doors, you will experience a transformation in your life. If you enter all these eight doors, your consciousness will be transformed completely. Each one of us make that choice now. This is an exploration of the human experience that Mir Baba invites you to knock and open these doors. He has opened the door fully, as you can see. Enter it with love, devotion, and humility, and embrace him so that he can walk with you on the new life journey. So this is just a preamble to the beginning of the new life journey. And